So what I'd like to talk about now um, is uh, best practices. Um, these are techniques which we've often found very effective within our own group, which are widely, or many of these techniques, very widely used within uh, software development and uh, building of, of programs, which I think can be applied very readily to the modeling context. Um, we noted this morning this, the fact that um, regardless of whether you want to call it uh, validation, verification, or whether you uh, use the term building the right model and building the model right, we have both considerations um, at play when we're, when we're constructing a model. We want to make sure this is the model we actually want um, and that this is the model we intended to build, that our actual implementation is what we intended to build. And there's some principles of software engineering which, um, which apply to this. And I'm not one for getting tied up about the labeling, um, but I broadly define to uh, classify them into sort of technical guidelines and process guidelines. And I'm going to talk first about the process guidelines because I think they they are arguably um, more important or more 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 fundamental um, in in shaping the quality of, of um, the models you build. Okay, um, and some of these things are things I've already mentioned. I'll try to go very light in general, but especially on those. Um, but others may be, uh, may be new. Um, it says recall, it really shouldn't say recall. Really here we're dealing with process, uh, process suggestions. Um, uh, and some of them are, are listed here. Peer review, using tools for version control, uh, keep tra careful traffic experiments, strive for improving your process over time, not just your model. Um, use focus prototypes where appropriate, perform simple tests and integrate with other works, people's work frequently. Okay. We talked about how we could generate documentation from a model, um, how it could generate documentation on, on uh, features of a model that have changed um, and allow you, give you some sense about where things are within the model. I'd like to talk about some other things though. One is, is the whole issue of incremental delivery. And um, we talked about this earlier, so I won't spend too many more words on it. Um, suffice it to say that uh, in a modeling context, um, it's particularly key for just understanding what the model's doing to try running it on an ongoing basis as you add small things to it. It gives you a sense where that behavior is coming from. So even beyond the issue of testing correctness of that model and improving your motivation, um, you, you will ba gain greatly by building these small steps, seeing, seeing what's changed and relating that to the nature of what, what you did. And by checking to make sure that model reproduces the early results under very simplified conditions where possible, where it is possible to do that. Um, I had noticed a variety of, of, of benefits uh, for this. Another principle is continuous integration, and really this applies um, when you have several different people working on the same model, to put your changes together frequently so that if there's incompatibilities, if there's misunderstandings, they're identified as soon as possible. Um, and so that you'll make sure that you've understood what the other person is doing well, they'll understand what, what you're doing. Um, so it, continuous integration is conceptually different from, it's really a matter of team context, but helps support incremental delivery, okay? And one of the things that, that um, is helped by version control systems is continuous integration, um, being able to, to bring different parts of a model together. Um, managing process complexity. Well, we, we, we talked about this earlier, um, uh, about the use of uh, version control systems and, and systems like Silver to cross-link the different components of a, of a project so that the assumptions behind them so that the motivations for building them or the intentions um, and um, the conceptual relationships, um, they have referential integrity maintained uh, between different artifacts, between um, output and the parameter assumptions that went into it and the particular version of the model. Another issue is risk-driven testing. Um, uh, it turns out that um, 
that while it's really not talked about almost at all in terms of models, this may shock Dylan. Um, uh, while it's not talked about virtually at all in the modeling space, uh, maybe I shouldn't say virtually at all, talked about very little. Um, testing is one of the most key things that you can do with your agent-based models, or for that matter, assist dynamics models. Um, going through and putting it through its paces to make sure that no obvious bugs have, have, have crept through. And even testing things on an ongoing basis um, uh, to make sure the basic operation of, of different pieces are working. It turns out that because we're working in Java, there's some tools that we can leverage that will aid this process. So there's this tool called JUnit, um, which is a unit testing tool, which uh, people like Dylan use on software projects. And it can be used to test portions of a model um, quite independently. The idea here is that you have sort of a test harness for the model, and you put it through some paces very simply. So using some scenarios that are not your typical scenarios, but simply test some, some simple operations. The problem is that broad any logic testing is made more challenging by the need to create appropriate test harnesses for different portions of it. So a person has to live in a context of a main class, so you can't test that person so easily independently of that main environment. But what you can do is you can create very, very simplified main environments that have people embedded in them, and you can use that main environment to test the person's operation, for example. Um, so you can create alternative uh, experiments just for focused testing that you can run after a big change to the model, for example, to see to make sure it reproduces the expected behavior. Um, and you can create alternative startup logic in main that calls testing specific method methods. Um, I may have included a model in the example models that, that supports, that has JUnit as part of, uh, uses as part of it. The idea is to be able to put through a model model through its paces, or at least some paces, to make sure that it's, it's um, operating OK. Because often a model will have many moving parts, and it's unfortunate if we have to test all those parts together, just kind of throw them together and get them to run, um, which is unfortunately sort of the common practice. And if there's a way to test things independently, um, it's desirable to be able to do so. So um, JUnit is something that I'd urge you to investigate. It's not super easy to test your model really thoroughly, but if you could just do a little, a few basic tests at least, um, uh, even with a very small population, et cetera, it can be very valuable sometimes. It spare yourself um, um, having errors. One thing I'm trying to get the folks at XJ Tech to add in, the folks who create any logic is some automatic build functionality. So when you build your model, it kicks off some testing processes, for example, mm -hmm. or you have the option to do that, or kicks off processes that will run documentation software or software to deploy things to a database or software to inspect code style. Um, these are things that are par for the course in the software development world and could really be fruitfully used in any logic to really rigorously test your program. So what we're talking about there is something where you wouldn't have to do the test. They'd be all run, or a bunch of them will be run for you automatically every time you build the software. And that's very, very desirable. That's how large software projects these days keep, keep things from exploding in terms of errors. They run tons of tests when you go to create a new, a new step of the system. And in fact, even when you check things in, add your code to other people's code, it will run a whole bunch of checks on it helps you track down any issues as soon as possible. So, so testing is something to be worth thinking about, even if it's manual testing periodically, just to make sure things, obvious things are working. Okay, I want to talk also about prototypes. Um, it turns out that sometimes you, you face a fork in a road with your project. Should I do it this way or this way? And it's best if you can step back from that and create a little model which kind of, rather than trying to do it on your project right now, you create a little model that fleshes out an idea of how you do it. Maybe you do two little models, one for each way you might, you might do it. And basically they, they help exhibit what would be involved with approaching the problem in different ways. 
and that may allow you to make a much more judicious uh, assumption. And often these really small models in any logic can be created very readily. You can create them much more quickly than you could trying to make your whole model go one way first and then the other way. It'll sort of uh, serve as a means of brainstorming. One thing computer scientists learn is that there are times where you know, focused experimentation, trying something, gives you much more insight than just sitting back and musing about it. Actually going and seeing, seeing how well this does or how well that does um, in representing something will sometimes give you much clearer insight about the real, what the real trade-offs are. Okay? So this whole idea of focused prototypes is, is um, really valuable. So they can help you identify risks, help you identify how you'd work something between components, how ugly or pretty a, a certain approach is, um, et cetera. Um, probably the most important of all the comments I'm going to have is the one I'm going to talk about next. And this, again, is something that I almost never see discussed in models. Virtually never see discussed. It is a best practice to the point that a software development output that did not practice peer reviews would be viewed as you know, a larger scale software development effort that doesn't do peer reviews would be cer certainly out of the norm and viewed as dangerously unprofessional. So within software development, um, there's a uh, culture that's grown up of what are termed peer reviews. These are not review of the performance of peers. These are reviews of artifacts produced by peers. Okay? So for example, I'll, redu I'll review your model, you'll re review my model. When we say review, it's not a matter of, of grading it or marking it. It's a matter of helping to look over it to get feedback and to spot potential issues. And it is hard to express, to overexpress how valuable these can do, these can be in spotting possible errors. So, um, the software industry depends very strongly on testing to help produce rigorous software. But it turns out that reviews are viewed as more cost-effective than testing, and more effective than testing. They can find a larger fraction of bugs than just can testing. They can do so with less human time per bug found. They easily pay for themselves, and they're more flexible than testing. You don't have to wait until the model is completely finished. You can look at it when it's still early in its stages of development. And this is key, because it really may let you shape that course of development at a time that it's most flexible, where you can, you can, you can um, make those adjustments before you have to throw away a lot of code um, to make that adjustment make the adjustment early when, when things are still subject to, to flexibility. Um, and you can use these things to assess communications issues too. How clear is the model to read? How easy is it to understand? Etc. So, um, you know, peer reviews uh, assist those reviewing the artifact, person's artifact is being reviewed, and it can spread attitudes in the general culture interesting ways of implementing things, say in any logic, spread of standards or coding styles, and um, it can spread the, the, the importance of writing code with other people in mind. So it turns out that often just knowing that someone will review, review your model helps you put that extra little bit of care into making it clearer, et cetera. Okay? Um, now, there's a set of guidelines to reviews. I don't have time to go over here. But there's a wonderful book uh, by Carl Wiegers, and it's, I think the citation to it is given here, Peer Reviews in Software, that I'd really urge people in this room to think about reading, um, or at least think about having a copy of it and consulting it. It, it lays out a set of different types of reviews. Um, and um, I, I sometimes show a slide of it, but there's something on the order of maybe seven different types of reviews they talk there, and they don't have to be super formal. These are not necessarily heavyweight things. The reviews could be as simple as building a model with someone by your side, someone sitting next to you, looking over your shoulder, and programming is called pair programming, and it's, a, it's viewed as being a fairly effective technique to help lower the risk of mistakes and it can help you build a better model, both from the standpoint of 
uh, building the right model, building the model right. Um, but it goes on the other end as far as uh, formal inspections, which um, uh, which are, are an industry best practice in software. Um, basically, they involve uh, they involve uh, planning the inspection ahead of time, inspecting documents before the beginning of it, um, and uh, it involves reviewing that material, and then and then having a meeting with well-defined uh, participant uh, responsibilities, where the informally. Um, the author describes the perspective on the project. Um, the inspection package uh, is maybe delivered before this time, ideally, or, or in the meeting if necessary. And, um, and then um, a different person than the author may present the project. And there'll be a reporter, there'll be someone moderating it, there'll be several people reading it, and they'll construct uh, an inspection summary report and an issues log, which may be followed up later. So here's various participant ro roles and so on um, uh, within this. The author, the moderator, the reader who presents the code and is often different than the author, the inspectors who basically study the model and read it over, identify possible issues, identify possible confusions. Even if they don't identify an issue, they may identify a point of confusion um, that led them to think it was an error that needs to be documented. Okay. Um, and a recorder documents the issues. Um, and then uh, typically there's a rework stage where the author addresses concerns and then there's a follow-up which basically confirms the changes have been successfully made and they were well understood and so on. Um, this is the most formal of these processes um, and, and it's really valuable. It's a really valuable process. Yeah. <coughs> So the reflection needed to, to pull together that documentation, exactly. even if the document itself were to vanish, that learning is often a key, key part. Exactly, exactly yeah. right. And the other thing that I want to mention regarding what you just said is that peer reviews is, is really a point not only just to find bugs or problems, yeah. but if one look at that as part of an agile process, yeah. then one notices That the experts' uh, expertise, you're saying that the, 
then it, it, they have uh, better performance or better expertise if, if they are working together yeah, and working brainstorming. Together, the outcome, mm -hmm. the outcome, if let's say I'm doing the model for, let's say, uh, yeah. this model, yeah. that model will become better yeah. Yeah. if instead of being done by an expert, oh, it's I see. done by this team that is able to engage mm. like what they are working together, mm. right? They, the outcome will be better. Mm. Even though yeah. he may be a better expert, Right. And that's kind of an interesting point that we don't believe in that many times, but it's been already so much uh, studied that I think it is, I wanted to mention. Yeah, I think, I, you know, this is a very, very important point. I think what you're, what David's highlighting here is what I also was attempting to highlight, but I think he speaks very eloquently about it, and that is the fact that, um, that within the software engineering world, um, there's there's really uh, good studies documenting the significance or the um, importance of some of these effects um, and the um, the very significant gains that can be had by some of these quality oriented uh, processes and and uh, by and large those are unappreciated or vastly underappreciated in the modeling world now some in system dynamics there has been some attention to the importance of talking about the um, the value of the modeling process and changing people's mental models very early on, that's a big focus of attention. But, um, you know, particularly in the whole process of agent-based modeling, there's very little explicit discussion of this. And I think there needs to be, because um, it strikes me that a lot of, a lot of um, agent-based modeling projects may be not only reinventing the wheel, but maybe reinventing the flat tire, you know, or the square wheel. They're, they're going to have to invent the square wheel first, and then they're going to invent the hexagonal wheel, and then maybe we'll make, you know, octagonal, octagonal wheel, and eventually maybe we'll get a, a, a round wheel. But we could short, we could, you know, speed up that process greatly, I think, by, by adoption of best practices from other folks who are building computational artifacts. Because we, too, w we're not building just any old program, but we are building computational artifacts. We are building executable systems here and uh, a lot of the best practices apply more or less directly from from the software area so um, is this similar in software engineering you have something called quality control as well right? quality assurance and quality control right. yeah so would this be considered part of that or is this a dynamic step that goes on during the modeling whereas the quality control quality assurance happens after your model um, n no, I mean, broadly I would think of this as part of, uh, of quality assurance, but I think what David's also highlighting is it's not merely quality assurance. I mean, um, well, we think of the two separate in, yeah. in, in, in as far as FBA is concerned, you spread out the two CQA. Yeah. There are two levels from QA. There is one level that is internal QA that practices quality process that is internal to the development process, and then there is the quality assurance process that is for compliance. Compliance is a different level of quality assurance. And the one that I'm talking about is the one that gets you to get something you want, to build something. And, and when that has to be the closer to the source, the closer yeah. to the person building, the better it's going to be. Yeah. The farther away, the yeah. worse it is. So the, the earlier, first of all, the, earlier you, the the earlier you get into a system, the concept, like we are saying, eliminate the bug from mm -hmm. the very beginning, the earlier. Build very small. All these things are very, very close to the core of the team doing it. Right. The earlier you do it, the better your code, the happier the people, and yeah. the less quality assurance, the compliance problems you will have. Well, the more modelers you have working because on the project, that's a, a difference like because it's gonna it's gonna go through a series of particular standards and guidelines and all that's the right. That's and the other exactly. You cannot change that. That's right. That's right. Well, that's quality assurance. Quality control is a bit different for us. Yeah. So quality control would be the equivalent of sort of what you're doing, what you're discussing here, hmm. in the sense that it happens two ways. Sometimes just one modeler will build the model, and then when we prepare the 
I mean, yeah, here a lot of it is also a focus on um, having the norms and the, um, the an understanding of, of the standards uh, well, in, uh, you know, well enough ingrained in everyone as a part of a culture, you know, um, that you end up um, you end up heading off the risk or greatly lowering the risk that a misunderstanding will come in and manifest as a bug. I think the reason this isn't talked about much is because, as far as this team work for modeling, is that once once you start modeling, you get so far into it, you don't want to be told, "Oh no, we got it. We found a bug." You know, they find a bug right. you didn't think of right. or didn't find. Right. And then you got to go back to the drawing board. So there's a bit of arrogance on some modelers to not want to actually work. Open it up. Not let the sun shine in or whatever. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of the way to deal with that is to just make it a very routine thing so it doesn't seem like a witch hunt. It doesn't seem oh, like right, a, exactly. a, a personal that attack. A that's yeah, and, and doing it early so that it's not, you know, this thing where after you spend years of work, your your product is at risk now, okay. you know, by by the slings and arrows of those external to it. And instead getting in from, you know, on, on the ground level and and having this team sort of looking o it over uh, early on and giving feedback and so on. I mean, this this can be extremely powerful, as oh, David it says. Is you know. and, <laughs> and it transcends the mere, and I think this is what David was getting to, it, it really transcends the mere communication of information. It's more of, it's more a matter of kind of, um, um, you know, synergies yeah. between how people think about it and learning from each other and, and, and helping to, to spread norms of, of, of best practices and, and standards learn from each other because there's so much that you know I would learn from looking at a good model for example um, and and that's extremely important and that's not realized if we're sitting in our own cubicles even if we're each exceptional modelers you know that that interplay so um, so anyway peer review so the, those are some comments on 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 the process side